Timeless, Chapter 2, Unbalanced Scales His words rang out across the throne room, prompting a disturbed silence from the two equestrian rulers. Explain. Princess Luna stated, as she and her sister now both moved to sit in front of the unicorn. We wish to hear you say exactly what a satyr's paw is, and we will correct your statements should it be false. The use of such an artifact is a severe crime, and we wish to confirm that you know what such an item was, and is, capable of. Luna continued, and Celestia simply nodded. Such a powerful artifact. To think it was found and used, I... I thought them to be rare, beyond compare. I found it. The paw was washed up on the side of a lake. Shifting Sands began, head bowed, as he sat in front of the two monarchs. Of course, such an evil thing has a mind of its own. A satyr's paw, as I understood back then, and more so now, is an artifact of unimaginable power. Each outstretched finger of the paw indicated a wish, usually three. I found it with two wishes left. I knew that it could grant me any wish my heart desired, but the cost would be great and horrible. It's a cursed item where no good can come from it, so it was said. That much I knew back then. And yet you proceeded, Luna said. Celestia letting her sister take the lead, and this did, after all, concern one of her knights. Thank you, sister. I had no other option to save them. Who would that be? Do continue your tale, Private Sands. We wish to hear of what you've been doing for the past 1,000 years. The unicorn shook his head briefly, not in refusal, but as though a series of gnats were buzzing in front of his vision before nodding. It was during one of the plagues. Common things back then. My family was stricken, and nothing worked, be it the medicine I bought or the spells that I used. I was the middle full, and the only one not affected. My parents were elderly and hit the hardest with illness. My two sisters and two brothers were also near death. They could barely move, despite all having been strong enough to be working at their jobs not one week prior. The place. We remember. He took a deep breath, sighs shivering. The previously stoic knight now looked rather disturbed, his forelimb shaking. Shifting Sand's eyes seemed to glow a rather sinister red for a moment before the strange affliction passed. I apologize. Moments of clarity are difficult to process for me, and usually all blurs together. Magic and emotions surge and mix and cause that unsettling effect, so I've been told. I apologize for the unprofessionalism. He muttered, not seeing the surprised yet knowing glance, the two rulers shot at each other nor the immediate words they exchanged silently. We've both felt this, haven't we, Luna? That lack of clarity, a breath leaving our lips as the day passes? Well, yes, but not to this extent. That was when we were adjusting to our timeless nature, but that's, this is a different case. His eyes, though. An interesting set of facts worth watching. I found the paw as though fate itself gave it to me when all other options were exhausted. I knew the penalty, both legally and magically, but for my family, I would suffer whatever the consequences were. But I didn't wish for them to be well, though, for I knew the paw would give unto them harm. No. I wished to gain the power to save them, the power of the alicorns, or otherwise. I wished that I could save them so they would all live out their full and happy lives. And then I knew, with such phrasing, that the penalty would likely fall to me rather than them. Or at least I hoped. A noble, although ill, advised choice. Luna mused. Shifting paused, collecting his thoughts briefly. It worked, though. After I made the wish and stood over my family, I could have sworn I grew wings briefly in a power that I'd have never felt before coursing through my veins. The healing spells that I previously tried now easily burned the plague from their bodies, and they were healed. As soon as I was done, the power faded from me, at least as much as I could tell. I then put upon one of the local forges, the fire incinerating it once and for all, and I waited for the ill effects. An artificial and corrupt form of ascending, perhaps? If for but a brief moment, the, the palm must have used that natural process to its own means. At least it was destroyed by fire, the only thing that could purge that artifact from the world. The unicorn didn't apparently notice or care as a few tears dripped from his eyes. I didn't notice the curse for a long time. I grew up to be strong, eating perhaps a bit more than normal without gaining much weight, but I thought nothing of it. My strength seemed to be greater than average, as well as recovering from wounds easier than most, but I attributed that to my constant training and good health. A few years passed, and my parents died of old age. I didn't notice anything as I buried them, nor after my siblings got married. 
Blinking, the stallion looked around and nodded as though reaffirming to himself that everything was in its proper place. His eyes seemed to struggle in focusing on the rulers for a moment before returning to their floor-focused gaze. The first thing to truly make me realize that something was wrong was when I finally asked him there to a dance. I fancied her and I thought it proper, especially as a newly sanctioned lunar knight. I seemed to blink and the dance had long since passed and I, I don't think I ever attended. The knights had been disbanded and I was simply a guard for a town I can't recall. I blinked again and she now has a happy family while I now commanded multiple soldiers of a local garrison. My siblings were now old and had families of their own and I then understood the curse of how insidious the magic was. More tears ran from his eyes, and the stallion seemed to sway on his hooves. Shifting now looked up to the rulers, eyes clear, and genuinely horrified. Is this what it's like, your highness? See time and love pass away. In an instant. He asked, then looked away. I dared not reveal myself to you, Princess Celestia, for a strange fear had gripped me. Likely of death or other punishment, I, I don't recall the reason, nor specific dread. I then finally and fully realized the curse. Not a wrinkle dotted my face. My limbs were always filled with vigor, and most wounds healed at a surprising rate, yet my mind was weighed with a great burden. I was cursed with a physical body that would not yield to time and age, even as my mind struggled to comprehend it all. With that discovery, I made plans. It's... it's odd. I can remember everything between the times I seem to blink, but it's muted, fuzzy at times. I remember it all, yet it seems to skip years and leaps and bounds. I can go through each moment in clarity, yet it's all behind a strange cloth, dulled somehow. And then I blink, and the moment's gone. The knight continued to speak, still not noticing the cracks that appeared in both Luna and Celestia's impassive masks. To hear a pony describe such familiar events was disturbing and saddening on a level too personal for them to articulate. To continue, I went forward with my plans, bought emergency stocks, property, land, and if I was never to age, I would make sure that I'd live as comfortably as possible. And I did. I had enough bits to buy an island, or ten after, but a few decades, but by now, I could probably purchase all of Canterlot, I'd imagine, but I don't bother keeping much track anymore. I lived a noble's life for a time, a mansion, servants I treated with dignity and kindness, and then watched them grow old, and pass away as well. Pausing to see if the rulers had any questions, the knight then continued, the words flowing like a keg of cider, uncorked after a century. I lived a generation like that, but I grew tired of that life, and that was it. My cutie mark seemed to itch, indicating such a life was not for me. The closest I felt at home was when I was part of the Knights after all. Wealth had a little meaning for me, then as it does now. So I did what good I could with it, and then let my estates run on their own. And so I sold it all, founded dozens of charities, funded them, and began to walk and learn. A serene smile then meandered onto Private Sand's face, the most peaceful the two rulers had seen him as of yet. For hundreds of years, I walked and filled my mind with knowledge. I was guided to defend any creatures that I could. My cutie mark seemed to drive me to roads, to towns, to civilization in some way that needed protection or aid. At each destination, I found a way I could be useful. Perhaps it was a town needing a leader of their guards, or defending a besieged settlement from some ruffians, or even guiding a lost family back to the trail on the roads. I must have traversed all of Equestria and the wider world countless times, seen the heights of Mount Eris, the glory of Griffinstone, and even ventured into the uncharted lands, as brief as those moments were, all in my quest to quell the strange force that drove me onwards. The unicorn's face settled. A strange determination shining through his brown eyes as the pony's features continued to smile ever so slightly. Throughout it all, I trained with masters of combat and magic, expanded my abilities to the limits of which I discovered rather quickly. I was able to improve and expand my talents, but only to a point. My physical body, I painfully discovered, was susceptible to harm, but at a lesser degree than many. 
I've been wounded countless times, but have shrugged off other grievous injuries that would lay out any other pony. And yet I was not invulnerable by far. And so, with those limits, I learned as much as I could, and trained as I wandered. If I was to walk this land for such a time, then I wanted to be prepared to help as many as I could, and I trained for such. Shifting seemed to sit a bit taller now, as though retelling that portion of his life was a torch in an otherwise black abyss of pain. I couldn't escape my curse, but helping others seemed to lessen the impact somehow, and it gave meaning to my life. I had the bits to pour into those who were touched by poverty, the will to organize and build a school, but defending the helpless, instructing others on how to do the same, that was the closest I've ever felt to being alive ever since I used the paw. It was those moments I felt the most present in the world, the most real. His vision then darkened, the unicorn looking to the floor. The world has always been broken though, and in so many ways. Lesser as of late, but there's always something to help with, as is life. I helped, and gave all that I could. And yet there was always a corruption, but a disturbed pony who destroyed a family, a noble with too much influence over a town, or a rogue faction who delighted in pain and suffering. I tried to fix it. I did fix it, so much. That's what I feel alive doing, after all. Helping. Defending hiding. But there was too much. The hurt. The death. It seemed to overwhelm the good I and others were doing, but is that true? I don't know. The darkness has slowly grown, and I have trouble seeing the good at times, despite it being all around me. It is distant, as though my efforts have been shoveling sand through a gold sieve. The unicorn's hooves began to shiver slightly, as Shifting's brow narrowed, eyes darting across the floor, as though scanning over a dozen enemies set to beset him. So much pain. It blends together. I have to try to remember the good, because everything else is clearer. The deaths, losing friends I made, times I arrived too late to save a life, and times I simply couldn't do anything but watch. Perhaps that's part of the curse, or a millennium of memories crammed into my head, I, I don't know. I tried to fix it all, but whenever I did, whenever there was a happy community, I blinked. And something happened. After every happy memory, there's nothing but death. I couldn't fix it all. Not even close. I... I think... He looked up now, staring at the two in what appeared to be confusion, and a strange, unsettled sense of self-realization. I think something broke after a while, your highness. Something inside of me did, at least. I continued to help, but it didn't feel the same. I then heard of the prophecy of your return, or the afflicted version of you, at least, Princess Luna, and so I sought to then ask for your help and your judgment. I certainly had not given up my vows. I was determined to prevent those cultists from succeeding. That said, I hope that... Perhaps the good I've done would lessen my sentence, but would not shy away from the final judgment of it all. The Lunar Knight bowed, taking a deep breath and nodding to himself. In a concise manner, your highness. That is my tale. I submit myself to you for judgment, in whatever manner that may be. If nothing else, I would beg for your assistance in lifting this curse, so perhaps I may experience my final sentence in complete clarity. Even if it's just but for a day. I am not entirely sure why, but I love to read and act out something as dramatic as this, where it's someone telling a sob story of some kind in a sorrowful manner. It's a bit weird and messed up in some cases, but it's just so emotional. I love that emotion. Of course, I could have just simplified it and said I love dramatic stuff, but eh, whatever. Now, how about we hop on over to our immaculate donators. Top donators, Dash of Evergreen. Peter Coltard, J Tin Man, Darkseid, and Ponyman. 
Courier Cruise CI, Strix, Zar630, Narwhals, Delta Omega, RuneScythe9852, Dospo, Rhiny Dragonwolf, Hunter Norman, Austin Rowland, Secret Moon, Tal Rasha, The Toilet Snake, Sword Brethren Mordred, Ron and Wandering, Android 63, Random Person Man Guy, Easy, Jack Cadge, Sky Uchiha, Starlight Glimmer, Squiddy Boy, David E. Sanchez, Soul Dragon, Gaggy, Trey, Shadow Drake, Joe Piercy, Alex F, Rainbow Dash, Teal Anderson, TV Killer, John Becker, Leon Reynolds, Zach. Karkow, Mystery CU, Leslie Prickett, Edgar Garcia, One Kingdom One, Nissa Rusan, Vasuri, Dyslexic Character Sheets, and Just Random Boy. Thank you all very much for watching this video, and live life to the fullest.